program, but you are going to see a lot of the new upcoming people. They've got a wonderful show going on, so you're going to learn a lot of stuff, and you might see me more than you might think. Well, the grand old library ain't so grand anymore. Well, they've gone fucked off Hank Wills and they don't give a shit before. If you're a musician, a songwriter, or if you work in the business, Nashville has its own way of doing things. If you're going to make it as a country star, you got to go to Nashville. Det er med god grund at Nashville går under navnet Music City. Byen der er på størrelse med Aarhus ligger som bæltespændet i det amerikanske bibelbælte i sydstaten Tennessee, og det er som hovedstad for countrymusikken Nashville har spillet sig ind i verdenshistorien. Ikke mindst takket være en stærk musikindustri med det magtfulde radioshow The Grand Ole Opry i spidsen siden 1925. Da i Nashville den uregerlige Hank Williams blev countrys første superstjerne, inden han i 1953 døde som 29-årig af et misbrug af sprut og medicin. Men inden Hank Williams død, nåede han at sprede sine gener. Og Williams aftager er bestemt adresse med den kommersialisering og poppet renskurighed, der siden har præget countryen for Nashville. Nashville is taken country music and they slandered it. A good example would be Garth Brooks. Look at he used to work down on Music Row. He knew how the system worked. He was a marketing major and all this stuff and he knew what he had to do. Standing outside the bar. Standing outside the bar. It's insulting to me when they call somebody like Toby Keith country music. So settle up the balls and let's go draw. We're not going to let them win. They can't have it. They can call it country music, but it doesn't belong to them. It belongs to the people. The reason I like country is it's in my blood. So I paid a freer down for mine and melt your cold. I keep the ends out for the tie that binds because you're mine. I walk the line. Dolly Parton's a great singer. She's referred to as, you know, being a legacy act. If you bought the newest record, it's probably pretty good. It will always take people like myself and Hank the Third and Joe Buck and all these cool people to sort of bring Nashville back to its honest roots. We're not rocket scientists. We're just simple people. Music City's dead. It ain't what it seems. No. Make it you Billy mean. Nashville, Tennessee, Music City, USA. Welcome to Tennessee, goddammit. I'm heading back to the country to a trailer on the lake in the shivering pines. In the woods there's a song on the wind I'm swaying to And moonlight drips like rays of smoke on a raging fire I'm leaving innocence lost in the city of the country star I loaded my truck I'm driving out of the city I'm driving out of this city Driving out of this The whole reason I wrote that Music City's Dead is because it was so funny. 70, 80 years of just amazing American art being made here. And they get a professional football team 
And all of a sudden, they no longer call it Music City, they call it Titan Town. I was like, amazing. A football team can come into the town, and all of a sudden, rich history just wiped away. I don't even know if they call it Music City anymore. It looks like they're trying to. Music City, dead. Music City, dead. This is Lower Broadway, the last bastion of what used to be Nashville, really. Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. Willie Nelson, Chris Christopherson, those guys all played in there. Hank Williams used to hang out there when it was called Ma's Place. Back in the 50s and 60s, like, there was probably a hundred honky-tonks in this area. Every one of them with live music. All great bands. Now the whole little street's been reduced down to about four or five of them. You know, I guess you notice everybody's staring at me because of my hair, but it's like fed this mohawk forever and it's like country music looks like this How's country music look? like this is that how it looks yeah it is <laughs> we're here at the new country music hall of fame been in here a couple of times but i'm really looking forward to seeing the new hank williams exhibit it's good that people care about country music jay win mm -hmm. what's your name partner What's yours, buddy? Samuel. I was born on a farm in Missouri. I went my whole life hating country music because I was from a farm. This is your life show that you had. The media and even music had told me that everything that where I'm from, I'm a low-class, ignorant, buck-toothed fool. And for some reason, I believed those people. So I ran from my country roots. And thank God to one amazing incident, I was, when I left home about 17, I just fell into drugs and alcohol and punk rock music and rock and roll. And I happened to have a friend that was the produce guy at the Piggly Wiggly. And he came over to a party I was having. And he was like, I don't like none of that crap you all play at your parties because I brought you some real music. And he had the 40 greatest hits of Hank Williams. I was 21 years old. When he put that in, I'm getting chills on the back of it thinking about right now. When he put that in, it was the music I had heard all my life, but never heard. That's Hank 3's suit. I said that would be in the Country Music Hall of Fame someday. My God, his boots are in there. When we were younger, we were around each other a good bit. Older. Every show I've ever played with him, he wore those. There's, there's a man right there. I owe so much to that young man right there. I never dreamed in a million years that I would ever get to play the Grand Ole Opry. And for this once drunk junkie to get to play the anniversary of Hank's death on the Grand Ole Opry with his grandson was the great, and, and now my now deceased father, to see me on the Grand Ole Opry, it validated it for him that maybe I hadn't wasted my life. And for that, I will always be grateful. I mean, I, I couldn't have written that story any better. It was, up to me and wants to talk about the family. I'm always, you know, patient, willing to talk about it. All right, I'm Shelton Hank Williams III, and you guys are at the Haunted Ranch here in East Nashville. It's Hank Williams. That's that's my granddad. On that, it's Hiram Hank Williams Sr. Well, oh, a female that burns down low. We ain't got no I 
always keep everything I get from the fans. For, for some reason, it feels like it's a a power thing for me, or makes me feel like I've done something. Well, I'm drinking that whiskey. If I'm upset, I can put on a country record and get it out of me instead of putting a gun to my head and taking the easy way out. You know, it's that music is there to help people survive. Thanksgiving goes high time. That cash is gonna sing it low. And I'm here getting wasted with all my country heroes. The way I've always looked at it, my granddad sang about the light, and I always sang about the dark. I'm getting wasted just like my country heroes. This is the last badass right here. This was Johnny Cash's guitar, and he gave it to my dad, and then my dad gave it to me. But the belt buckle scratches on the back has from Johnny Cash. What I was trying to rebel against is you, you always love what you can't have, okay? Well, I was raised going to church. I had to go to a few Christian schools. So what's going to appeal to me? Naturally, hail Satan and fucking heavy metal, okay? That's a good way to start. Um, and my mom was a very, as I would say, she was like a neo-Nazi Christian lady. And they were always scared to death, um, of where I was headed because I used to love Sid Vicious. I used to cut myself up and put safety pins through my skin and through my nose and, you know, just trying to rebel. rock band I've been in, these shoes have been with me. If you notice, my, my boots, I always have duct tape on my country boots, and they've done, they've been with me since 1994. And these, sh these shoes have been in Superjoint Ritual, Buzzkill, Bedwetter, Rift, Salida, um, Assjack, and Arson Anthem, and I guess that's about it. But they've been fucking hanging in there, so the duct tape goes fucking deep with me, man. If it hadn't been for Jason and the Scorchers, I wouldn't be doing this right now. It put everything in perspective. It's like, you can be a country boy, you can sing country music, but you can rock people's dicks in the dirt. All right. Even got his farmer Jason, have you seen that? which is beautiful because it's truly him. Well, I remember moving to Nashville in 81 and I was just dumbfounded when I got to town that no one else was doing what I had in my mind to do. And everyone was sort of like singing these songs about you know, their ex-wives, and every single record sounded the same, and we hated that stuff, you know. It, it had nothing to do with country music. We loved traditional country music, so we never, ever were rebelling against country music. We were, however, definitely rebelling against the sort of horrible late 70s, early 80s country pop that was happening out of Nashville at the time. We would do an old Jimmy Rogers song, and his version went like this. I love the women and I love them all the same I love the women and I love them all the same But we would do it like this I love the women and I love them all the same I love the women and I love them all the same But not enough to give them my name. It 
it was an instant. I mean, in the first verse, I said, this is it. We are on to it. This is what we're going to do. We would play Bluegrass Inn in Nashville. Then the next week, we would be in New York playing at the Danceteria to a bunch of new wave people with weird hairdos and, you know, really cool. And that's the kind of thing we were doing at the time, and we could do it. We could do both. So we were basically trying to take traditional American music forms and just giving them a real dose of modern high energy, basically, is what we did. These women make a fool out of me. Jason and the Scorchers were never trying to destroy, you know, what made country music good. We only tried to change it. That's how Jason and the Scorchers did it. I have an identical twin brother named Farmer Jason, uh, and he does music for little kids. I think he might be down at the chicken house right now. Come here, Petunia! Hooey! Hooey! Come on, Petunia! I'm gonna sing a song to you! There she is! Hello, Petunia! Hooey! Here we go! It's time for... The Farmer Jason Lunchtime Concert! I'm running down the highway, running down the line I'm running wide open and I'm really feeling fine With an amplifier and a crummy old guitar On the rock and roller and I'm gonna be a star I'm a punk, I'm a punk I'm a punk, I'm a punk, I'm a punk rock skunk Woo! Alright! Hey, ho! Let's go! Hey, ho! Let's go! Okay, the audience now! Are you ready, Petunia? It's your turn! Hey, ho! Uh, hey, ho! Hey, ho! Okay, that's not good. How are you doing in there? You making time with my girl? Hell, last time I saw him, it's like I go to go master my record, I come back to her having damn dinner with wine and shit <laughs> like that. It's there. like y'all having a date? Music Row is where this music is written, it's where this music is recorded, this is where it's published, this is where it's licensed, this is where it's marketed, this is where it's distributed, this is where the success of country music is determined and who those country stars are going to be. It all happens right here within, I don't know, three square blocks, right? But look around, country music, music from the country, what about this looks like the country? I mean, look at this. Does this look like the country to you? Nothing about what this is right here looks like, represents, or sounds like the country. So it's a joke. It's a big myth. It's a lie. They've created this infrastructure to spread money around because they realized back in the 1950s with the success of Hank Williams that, hey, there's a lot of money to be made off this. We can get rich off this. He spread the money around through publishing houses, licensing, recording, management, booking, all that stuff happens right here within this area. Look at these offices and you'll notice a lot of them are for lease right now. Why? Because all this, these are all dinosaurs. This is all something from the past. This is all going to change. All this is going to be wiped out because artists, you know, the new face of of music, I think, we don't need this. You know, we're smarter. We're smarter than these people. And you look at the people coming out of these offices, they don't look like folks from the country, you know? Country folks make country music, right? These aren't country folks. You know, I mean, look at these guys, you know? Those aren't hillbillies. You know, they, they think that Hank Williams is just some, you know, old hillbilly music. You ready? can always hear that train whistle around Tennessee. Well, I'm definitely blackballed from Nashville or the black sheep of the Bible Belt because I don't go down on Music Row and write my songs in the office and play the game and pitch them. I write songs for myself and um, that's, that's going against the grain. I kind of had everything reversed on me when I had a... Uh, a one-night stand that waited like 
uh, about two and a half years to tell me I had a kid and a judge saying playing music ain't no real job and you're gonna have to get a real job and my way of getting a real job was going down the music row getting a deal getting a band and getting out there on the road that was a way for me to start paying on the child support the insurance and the back pay and that's why I signed the, the dotted line and from that then you start realizing oh okay I just signed away all my rights to all my songs and then they tried to get me to be with the producer and stuff like that and it took me five to six years in the courtroom to say hey guys I'm doing this for myself we'll do the old Dick and Dixie thing man Coming from Tennessee and being from the South is a lot of the singing style. It's a lot of uh, a good bit of yodeling involved, good bit of moaning involved. Um, and that comes from eating it, living it, and breathing it. If you're living in the bar or getting your senses back by going out in the country or floating down the river or putting hay up in the barn, um, it's... I'd have to say there's a lot of uh, soul, I guess is the best word, that, that comes from the South. Straight to Hell was quite an impact. It, it drew in a lot of the metal kids and uh, a lot of the country fans and brought them, brought them together under the same roof. For Nashville, the Country Music Association and Music Row. This is the very first record that's ever had a parental advisory on it. You know, a parental advisory, the next one will have it, and we're just, that's what makes us a rebel. It's what keeps us, you know, in the underground or, or, or part of being uh, not clean pop country. Well, we're I went to its mascot was a Confederate flag, and I was raised in a Civil War town, and that's part of history. If it's good or bad history, it's part of history. And let's say I'm wearing these flags right here. Well, yeah, I'm proud of being from the South, and I'm proud of where I'm from. And that's why if some black dude comes up to me, I'll say, well, it's black and white in my skin. And a black guy taught Hank Williams how to play music. And uh, so I can understand both sides of that. I'm glad to see they still allow that. The world famous Ernest Tubb record store, we got to go in here. Well, how'd he do? What's happening, y'all? You need directions to a barbershop? I do, man. It's like because I got the worst haircut going. I wasn't going to say that. How you doing? Nice. Yeah, man. What you been up to? Oh, you know, beating down that road. I know that. I know that. Trying to stay busy. That's cool. Good How's, to see you, man. It's, been a while. it's one of the last places left. It's like where you can still buy Johnny Cash records, Hank Williams records, Little Jimmy Dickens yeah. records, Roy A. Cuff records. Little Jimmy Dickens. He's little, but he's loud. One of my personal favorites, Lefty Frizzell. I mean, where else record stores can you find? Right there, along that wall. It's about everything you need. Yeah, about everything you need is right there. Nice camera, man. I'm here, I've the blinds, I ain't got the no railroad foul. Right here's where it happened. They, they live, bled, and died in sweated country music right here on this street every day. And I'm proud to be a part of that. Absolutely. I'm proud you are. Yeah. I wish I had some money. 
That's how I started. Right down on Second Avenue. It's the back entrance to Robert's Western World. This is the first stage I ever played on when I came to Nashville, when I came off the streets. It was so funny because Robert wouldn't hire me. And I tried for seven months to get a job here. And on December the 7th, I walked in here. It's about 15 years ago. But uh, I walked up and they didn't have a singer. And he got me up on stage. It was about 10.30 in the morning. I didn't get off stage till 2 o'clock at night. That old boy worked for me for like 70 days straight. <laughs> Thank God he did, and I was grateful to have a job. They come here in droves. I hear like statistics like a thousand a day coming to be country music stars. You know, filled with dreams, filled with hopes. You know, and sometimes they find their dreams down here, and sometimes they find a lot more than they bargained for. It's pretty sickening if you actually see how many people come to this town with a dream. Dreams can come false as well as dreams come true. And then they have to sell all their music equipment just to be able to get back home because they're completely uh, destroyed. Then you see some like me that get lucky and fortunate and see their dreams come true. It's 2008. You know, and there are no country morals. There are no country values. There's not a country left. Look at it. High rises and mausoleums. To the rebels out there. Say. <laughs> 